So what I'm, I thought I'd do today is kind of um, introduce you to some, some of these concepts of Rudolf Laban. So he was, um, he was born in, you gotta say it, Bratislava. Is that how you say it? Bratislava. 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 Yeah. Bratislava. And um, it, was, it was kind of that time when um, Kandinsky was looking at what did art mean outside of the traditions of art. And Schoenberg was looking at what did music look like out of the tra traditions. And he was basically looking at what did movement look like outside of the, tra the traditions that came beforehand. Because the only way you learned prior to this was by going through a long educational process and absorbing kind of organically from your teachers over many years. There was never really a way to kind of look at it outside of the medium that you were involved in. Um, I think that will make more sense. So what Schoenberg did is said, there's this whole history of music, but what is actually music? What do, how do notes relate to, get to, to each other outside of the traditional um, constructs that have been developed over hundreds of years? Kandinsky did the same thing in terms of color theory, how color moves from one color to, to another. And that's kind of what, what Laban was looking at at the, same, at the same time. So there was kind of this movement that was happening um, in the first part of the last century, where that was the question. There was like a philosophical question going on. And those three kind of circulated really around Germany at the same time. There was something going on synergistically between the three of them. And it's not, very, it's not documented very well at all. So Ermgard Barteniev was one of his um, disciples, basically, who took the work to New York. Her uh, particular um, emphasis was on how you use the Laban work to, to create um, movement therapies. So she created a system called Bartene Fundamentals that was used to rehabilitate polio victims uh, in, the, in the United States. And it was, it's, her, it's her school that I, that I went to for two years. Okay, so in the context of this, in terms of what you guys do, um, movement is this very open, very complex thing. There's a lot of different ways to look at it and observe it, but there's not really a way to kind of document that ob observation. Now there's video, but you know, and other ways to kind of um, annotate it. But at this time, it's really about how do we, how do we create a language around observing what we're seeing? Um, and then there's a visualization component to it, there's a documentation component, and, in this particularly, there's a way to kind of embody that information as well. So I think that in terms of the way you work, there's definitely this relationship t between um, how you look at data and how you document it and how you're able to share it. So it's basically at the core of kind of communication. But movement has so many aspects and it's so kind of, it's in the wild. It's a, it's a you know, it's a form that's kind of out there, unstructured, right? Okay, so the, there's more aspects to his work than this in terms of how we looked at uh, movement, but the, the kind of main parts that we look at is body, shape, space, and effort. He also had kind of more philosophical components, which basically I think are pretty revolutionary too. Um, so he had these concepts that were basically like um, two sides of a coin. Like you can't be expressive without being functional and you can't be functional without being expressive in terms of your body. Like there's larger concepts like that. Um, you can't be stable unless you're mobile and you can't be mobile unless you're stable. So just in terms of like how we train the body in terms of doing stuff, he had all these kind of larger overarching uh, concepts as well. But these are kind of his ways of using kind of annotation and description to, to divide movement, human movement as we know it, into these kind of major parts. There's also, the, the idea of phrasing, like how you document um, phrasing like in music, he also had a huge kind of system of that as well. So just in terms of a, a method, this is already like kind of super complex and really uh, detailed compared to what Schoenberg was doing or, or Kandinsky. I don't know if anybody, is anybody familiar with what they kind of did, the Schoenberg, Schoenberg's work, 12 tone, music is based on 12 tones and this is the combination of those 12 tones. And Kandinsky basically said, colors have uh, relationships that can be documented and this color tends to move towards this color so this is how you need to use them. So again, it didn't become about form, it didn't become about representation, it became about kind of the harmony of colors. And um, so it's kind of really about observing the relationships of these dynamic elements. Um, so body is kind of the simplest one in a way in terms of basically he created a language around understanding 
the different parts of the body, because once you understand the body, you can understand how the body's organized. You can understand what's happening on a postural or gestural level. And then you can start putting symbols to that to see how it's actually moving into space. Um, I'm just not, this, is like, this is like a two-year program where I'm just giving you the, the overview of how the system is organized. But stop me at any point if you have any questions. Can you, can you explain a little bit the symbols? It's basically just saying, like, if you're moving, it's, it's, it becomes an annotation system. So if you said somebody is moving, they're running down the street. So you have the aspect of their body, like how their upper body is organized, how their lower body is organized, how their head is organized. You have the pathway that they're moving through space. You have the shaping qualities of, of their body. Um, and you basically can create an annotation system for that, that one moment. Um, but this becomes like the building blocks of the annotation system. So you really have to, and the people who've really been working on this for years and years, and I'm not at that level because this is the, um, the simple system is called Laban motif writing, which is kind of like the, the note version. But then the Laban notation system has, has symbols for tr tracking the, the head of your femur in the joint. Like it becomes that um, detailed in terms of how you can notate it. Um, so and some of these have to do with how you've organized your body in terms of upper, lower, left to right, diagonals, like that kind of thing. Um, shaping qualities, there's a lot of different ways to talk about shaping. A lot of shaping has to do with how your body is moving into different dimensions and how you're either widening your body or narrowing your body or shaping your body as a whole. And we're not gonna talk much about shaping. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about space. So. Um, um, this is in French, but basically, he basically found 26 points that kind of organize, organize you in this, the space that's around you. So he basically created this concept called a, a kinosphere, which is the space that an individual occupies and how much access they, they have to the space around them. And he used that as a, as a way of kind of creating um, a container for just even exploring space in those terms, because obviously there are spatial terms that have to do with architecture and, and larger metaphors. This is the metaphor of space around a body. Um, but this is basically what we're going to spend most of the time talking about today. This is just kind of like an overview of the symbols. So this image on the right is basically showing those symbols as they would actually be in three-dimensional space. So very simply kind of um, the diagonal lines represent kind of a higher plane. The dot in the middle represents the lower plane, a uh, middle plane, and the dark, the filled in color is the, the lowest plane. And then the different symbols represent where you are in terms of forward and backness. So that's how he basically started making symbols for even understanding the space around you. And this is what comes into scales, like how you document the movement that's, that's happening and, and, and making it. Okay, so effort is basically the kind of qualitative movements that we that we do. So, it's um, it's um, some people would say it's the expressive side of it, but it's really um, um, how we how what, what kind of quality we move we move with, and he basically um, aligned that to the, to the space that we that we move in. So. Um, We'll talk more about this as we go on, but basically through the different dimensions, you have different um, spatial efforts that he um, saw affinities to how people actually moved in real, real life. So again, his whole system is based on observation. Um, and it'd be really interesting to see this in terms of a data, in terms of data, but he basically, as he observed, he saw people who move up in space tend to move up with lightness. People who move down tend to move with strength. So if you imagine trying to shovel your ceiling, ceiling as, a tr as opposed to shoveling the ground, it's a disaffinity. It it's doesn't make sense in our, in our body. And in terms of there's, a, uh, there's an effort quality in terms of space, and if you watch people open doors, they'll tend to cross their midline to open a door. They won't open a door out. And doors, I think, are designed that way as well because it's probably based on our, our, um, our muscle structure and our bones. But moving across your body gives you more support than moving, up, than moving away. So people tend to, to gesture away from the body in terms of including people in the room. So that's called an indirect space. I'm including you in this conversation. But if I'm going to be pointed about something, I'm going to move across my body. So he just noticed that these things that are, that are these spatial effort affinities that tend to happen. Um, and that's kind of like part, that's 
the part of the whole system we're going to be talking about. Yeah, we're going to go through that. That we're going to go through that. Whole, that's where we're going to spend all the time. Okay. Uh, it's really going through all that in detail. Um, but yeah, that's that's essentially space harmony: the affinity of effort qualities to the space that we move in, and probably how our architecture of our bodies is designed to move in, to move in that way. So there's some kind of affinity to how our body is structured, to how we move in space, and the qualities that we we tend to move with. This is basically showing that um, the this is just showing the um, the motifs for when you start combining efforts and how you start creating multiple movement qualities from combining space effort, um, spatial effort in terms of um, flow, weight, direct space, time. Those are the those are the basics of the efforts. So Mark, looking going back to the last slide. This one? If I were to see one of those symbols, I would know the movement yes. that it symbolizes or it tells me that this is a recordation of a movement yes. or a recordation? Or yes. Or is it, okay. Th this is saying, so there's, n in this point, there's no spatial component to this motif, right. but it's saying that each one of these movements is a combination of three individual e efforts that then, if, you're, if you've studied the system, you know what the, what the movement is. So, so it's purely symbolic. It's purely symbolic. Obviously, there's some you know, sort of impression that you get looking at the lines that this is yeah. representing a gliding motion. This is representing a pressing motion. But, but it's a defined symbol. It's a defined symbol. Yes. And is this, this is what's kind of amazing about his whole, sim his whole system is that all these symbols are the way you record mu music this is how you you basically record multiple actions of the human body. And this is just one combination of multiple efforts happening at the same time. So would you be able to show for each of these symbols some gesture? I can show. Uh -huh. I, we, we, all, we can all get up and do it too as we get through it. So by, by, by putting this, this one so like in some string you can actually read them and say yes. things like somebody ran up the stairs and then jumped over the fence and then... Yes, the exactly, fence. exactly. So this is just the quality of the movement. It doesn't have to do with the body, it doesn't have to do with the shaping, it doesn't have to do with the space. It's just the quality. But as you combine them, which is the, I think it's the next slide, this is what starts to happen when you look at putting all those things together. So there's symbols in here for pathways, for phrasing, um, it's, so music goes uh, left to right, this goes bottom to top in terms of how you read it. So this is a, this is a movement score. And this is repeatable, let's say, if you would uh, show this to two skilled people which are capable of reading this, they would pretty much move the same, yeah. the same way. Before there was video documentation, there were Laban notation experts who would go around to the Ballet Russe and record what they were doing so that then other generations would have a record of what they did. Yeah. And, and the reason it works is because you're saying there's a universality to the way our bodies are structured and how their movements align up with the environment, the space around us. Laban saw that connection, but the language itself is, is just a language, but he saw that connection to how we moved and so he created these affinities, but you can also create a score that has nothing to do with the, the affinities. Yeah. Okay, so this is when we start looking at history, history um, pictures in history and stuff. So, th so this is a, exactly what Abe was just talking about. So a huge part of the work is this, uh, this idea of affinities in terms of effort and space, which as an overarching term, he called space harmony. And what he developed with this is, is um, basically marrying um, platonic solids in terms of the uh, um, expressions of three-dimensional space to these efforts to basically create movement scales in the way that you would have a music scale. So, and the idea of that, since, um, since our bodies are, um, have these affinities in terms of efforts, by looking at space three-dimensionally through these kind of um, architectural archetypes, you're actually learning to move more three-dimensionally than we're actually designed to do. So you actually get more access to space, and then if you're talking about function expression, you're more expressive and more functional at the same time. The same way that you, you practice scales to kind of like create kind of a, um, a skill in terms of your, your musical um, ability, you do movement skills to have more access to space and, and, and movement skills. So that's kind of the, that's the, the theory. So I'm just, this is just a, 
grabbed from Wikipedia in terms of what pl platonic solids are. I think that probably <coughs> you guys all know because you're like math people. But um, there's, um, I guess the, the faces are congruent regular poly polygons with the same number of uh, faces meeting at each vertex. Like that's basically the, the definition. And it's just called platonic solids because they were discovered at the time of Plato and there hasn't been any more discovered since that time. Um, so this is just an overview. So in Laban's work, he uses all of these symbols as ways of um, describing spatial tension in terms of how a person might be organized in, in their movement. Um, and I, I'll just leave it at that because we'll go through exact we'll go through examples, and then the the next slides are going to kind of like lay out the basics, and then we can kind of talk more about the what that means. So we all know, and even so, in your plotting of, of data and in your world, there's there's dimensions. So there's a vertical dimension, horizontal, and sagittal, and um, all of those symbols that you saw earlier actually match up to this as well. So the effort scale is affined to the dimensional scale. So what uh, Laban said is that our vertical dimension is uh, affined to our weight effort, and then the continuum of that is light and strong. Um, sagittal is, is time and uh, space is horizontal. And again, these are things that he observed that then became um, um, how we basically talked about the different movement qualities. So, um, so then if you go forward and back, it, it, these are how you're fine to forward and back. So people tend to move forward sustainedly because they don't know if they're going to get burned. There's, there's probably a lot of kind of anthropological reason why you do that. And then people tend to move back with quickness. So it's like a flight or, uh, fight or flight reflex. And then what I said before, into the direct or indirect. So it's always across the body or away from the body and then the light and strong. So it's very difficult to move strongly moving up, and it's actually move, difficult to move lightly moving down. That would be a disaffinity, and our, it would not be a natural movement pattern. Is that making sense? Um, <laughs> does this relate to left, right, uh, front, back? Yes. So um, the vertical is the vertical, up and down. And then if you're starting on your right side, direct space is across your body. So if you're starting on your right side, left is direct, and uh, right is open. So again, it has to be across your body to be direct and away from your body to be open. And then forward is sustained and back is, strong, uh, is quick. So if you did the left side, this would be direct and this would be indirect. Because as I'm talking, I'm just naturally doing it as well because I think there's something about how we're put together that if I want to include you in this conversation, I'm going to be opening up my body and I'm going to be indirect with how I'm using my space. But if I want to be direct with somebody, I'm going to be direct. So uh, yeah. could you also then read the person based on these three dimensions? Are you doing this? No. There is a, there is a study of this, which is um, there's a profiling study. It's called like Kestenberg Movement Profiles. It's also kind of aligned with um, Jungian, Jungian psychology, too, with shadow movements, where they basically they do it a lot for... Um, for working situations to see if people are going to be compatible in, in working situations by, by tracking shadow movements. Um, that's like a, again, this is a, this, there's a lot of applications to this work and that's kind of like a really refined application of it is, is, is profiling. So shadow movements are when you copy somebody's movements? Or? No, shadow movements are when um, I'll be talking and I'm actually, I'm actually cycling through different planes as I'm talking and I'm doing it in a really small way. So that's what I mean by, it's like more micro movement would be a better word for it than, than so like shadow. Gesturing while... Well, gesturing is kind of going to be kind of these gross, kind of big things. But shadow movements are these things that are tiny cycles through the planes that are almost not perceivable. And there is a person, a, a, a kind of famous, so the, when you go through the program that I went through, you're a, cert, you're a certified movement analyst. And there's one who, um, a famous person who uh, does um, criminal profiling as well in terms of telling if you're you know, telling the truth or not telling the truth type stuff. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of kind of psychological uh, applications of it. A lot of people work developmentally with children and, and that stuff as well. Uh, maybe before I go on, what's the connection between these two kinds of structures, tetonic solids and basically a skeletal muscular slash voluntary system of movement? 
So Laban feels like he saw a relationship between how our bodies are put together and how we move into space. And then the platonic solids are really just metaphors for this kind of um, space that has no shape to kind of give it, to give it a shape so that we can talk about it. So um, it's really just a, a spatial metaphor so that we know that forward right high is the same forward right high for both of us. So it becomes, a, it becomes a, a way of documenting it so we can talk about it. So it's, it's, it's really kind of a projection on his part to say, and I think this goes back to how um, classic Greek education is. It's like everything kind of went back to platonic solids and how we relate to um, the environment, to the, to, the, to the horizontal landscape and the, and the sky and the, and you know what I'm saying? So maybe to grasp this, should I imagine myself sitting, meditating in some, in each of these solids? Or? Well, that's the embodiment part of it. So if you were sitting meditating, you would be in the tetrahedron. You would be in this kind of space where you're grounded and your, your, your head is reaching up. And, the, and they would see you in that space because that's how your body is, is organized. The octahedron is the most clearly expressive of the dimensions because the dimensions are, are there. And then as you go into the cube and the icosahedron, you start exp expanding into diagonals and planes. So, so one thing that you may not know about the platonic solids is that they fit perfectly within each other. Right. So, the, so, so that's, and that's how his scales are set up. So. So this is, this is kind of where it goes into the difference between um, a dimensional scale and a diagonal scale. So, um, so this becomes the dimensional scale, and there's actually, like you can no notate it to say, this is how you go through the, di the dimensional scale. And then, um, and that becomes an expression of the octahedron. So when you see people who move dimensionally, you see them moving in the octahedron. So that becomes the metaphor for me being able to say, this person has a really different kind of movement pattern than this person because it's, it's based on the octahedron. This is really out there. And it's just kind of a fun conversation. It really should, you know, we're not going to be tested on this, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then the, to your point, the, um, the cube sits, in, sits kind of outside of it, and the points of the cube kind of make the planes of a, of a, of a the points of the octahedron make the planes of the cube. So if you think about um, like this place up here, that forward right part of the cube, it's, equal, um, it's an equal expression of all three dimensions. So whereas when you're in the octahedron and you're moving up with lightness, it's the expression of one effort and one spatial quality. As you move into the diagonals of the cube, you're moving through three-dimensional space on a diagonal and it's expression of all three effort qualities. Does that make sense as a as a as a thought? And we can, if you guys want to get up and try it, we can get up and try it. Because because the other you know, the other idea is like. What are the three effort qualities? The three, these are the three effort oh, okay. continuums. Yeah, so so you have the, the 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 weight, and you have the space, and you have the time. So those those are for him the baseline efforts. And then on top of that, you have this idea of flow, which is basically how you move between things. He didn't think that it was possible to ever move into single effort quality. You always moved in, um, you practice the single qualities to understand them, but you are either moving in states or drives. So a, a state is a combination of two efforts and a drive is a combination of three. So the diagonals of the cube represent drives. So that's the most powerful aspects of um, movement because it's very dramatic and you're kind of embodying all three things at once. So you can have a combination where you're moving back in time but with strong weight yes. because you need to ground yourself, yes. right? Yes, exactly. And you're closing your space if yes. you want to. And yeah. might be a retreat. Yes, and that's called a punch. Oh. Called punch. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah, so yeah. Of... And there's all words for all these different types of, of combinations of things. Um, so, so for me, to, for you guys, I think there's something interesting in this in terms of just visualization. Like you're, you guys are working with plotting and, and charts, and, there's, and this is obviously you know, a hundred year old version of that, but there's also this idea that he actually took it into space and felt it in his own body, which is out there and esoteric, but I think it's, it's an interesting consideration. 
so these are the diagonals like moving through those uh, the the um, the extreme points of a, a cube, and if and from this point in terms of body organization, you basically have no center at all. You're you're supported only in space in terms of the diagonal. So when you're in the octahedron, you have a really clear sense of verticality, which we probably mostly exist in. You see people moving in the cube when they're like playing extreme sports when they're throwing themselves through space. So a um, basketball player rushing down to like you know do a slam dunk is not going to be moving into the octahedron, he's going to be moving through the diagonal to move himself through space in that kind of erupt, uh, direct way. Could you say that one, one such uh, <coughs> element like this octahedron would represent a whole class of movements? Yes. So when you see ballet, ballet happens in the octahedron. Contemporary dance, not necessarily. Um, sports is not going to happen in an octahedron because you have to be kind of moving off center. If you're going to throw your body weight at a tennis ball, you can't be sitting in the octahedron because you're not going to have any power to, to react. Okay, so just to review, we kind of have the idea of a dimension, which we just talked about. So we just talked about the octahedron, which has the three dimensions, right? All right. Um, and, a, and, a, and a dimension has one pull. It only has one. And so, again, when you're working in the dimension of weight, you're really only focusing on one thing. You're not focusing on space or time or flow. Um, but when you move into a vertical plane, you actually have unequal stresses, un unequal spatial stre stresses. So the vertical plane is both vertical and horizontal. Right. This is this is this is all like stuff that you guys do, right? Does that make sense? The idea that there's there's uneven spatial tensions in planes. Sure. All, all yeah. Time. Yeah. Time. Are you, just, <laughs> no, no. I mean, uh, true, true. Uh, yeah. So it's just that we usually don't. Uh, well, in particular, our department we usually operate in many dimensions. Yeah. Uh, and once you have many, many of them, so thousands, hundreds of thousands. Right, sometimes. 800, then, some. Uh, yeah. 500, yeah, if you're young. Yeah. Uh, 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 then, uh, of course, the space gets different properties as well. Mm -hmm. uh, if you live in this 3D geometry, then um, everything is a little bit more compressed. Um, right. But uh, still, no, no, we understand yeah. the, the okay. language. Cool. So you have the, both the vertical and the horizontal, and then if you kind of put that into um, a cross of planes, so I have my vertical plane, I have my, um, my sagittal plane, which is mostly forward and back, but also vertical, and then I have my horizontal plane, which is mostly horizontal and also forward and back. So this becomes a cross of planes, and this is um, where movement starts becoming a little bit more dynamic, and this is where you see sports and all, all people having more kind of effort moving through it, because you're not actually just sitting on your own dimension, you're actually moving through um, uh, transitions that aren't based on just the dimensions. One question, so let's say, <coughs> uh, now we talk mainly about body, eh? mm -hmm. one single body. Mm -hmm. uh, can you uh, extend this towards the uh, groups? As sure. Well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, and also there's orientations in terms of space. So I can, I can reorient, reorient my kinesphere if I need to for, for some particular reason. Like it doesn't have to just be associated to my, my own body's spine or whatever the, the orientation is. Um, but then there, what, what Laban did a lot of in the way back when is um, they did these ideas of movement, movement choirs. So it's kind of similar to what the kind of the Japanese workers do every morning where they get up and they kind of move together. They did it in kind of this nationalistic way where they kind of like all moved in the same way and you basically create this um, this energy of everybody kind of doing the same thing together in the same way the, the kind of Japanese workers do it, I think. Um, but that was a whole movement back in that time when they were kind of like all naked on the hills moving together. You know, it was like a, it was like a kind of a... Um, it was very avant-garde for the, for the time. It was a very, very interesting way of, of living. Would you classify military movements? Parades so, and well, supposedly, so the rumor is, is well, that Laban did work for Hitler, and he actually supposedly put um, movement into the, um, the military movements that was actually 
um, what's the word? He was being, a, he's being kind of a dissident. And he was, pretty, he was basically loading up the movement with things that were, made them look foolish. But they felt like they were really strong and they felt like they were embodied, but he was actually um, discrediting them on a movement level. Really? Yeah. Um, okay, so we have, the, we have the planes we just talked about. And then if you expand that, if you basically expand those corners, you're basically moving into the, the icosahedron. So the icosahedron is basically the shape that represents our, our three dimensions as planes, whereas the octahedron is our, our three dimensions and our cube is our, um, um, is our diagonals. Okay, that's the basics. So if you guys want to try it, we can try it and I can show you what it is. Can you just, you showing that? Well, that's not fair. How's that fair? <laughs> You're professional, no. I think we should all get up and we'll try it. Let's just try it. It's simple. It's simple. We'll just do it. We'll just do it. Why not? Okay. So we have the vertical, we have the vertical dimension. We'll just do the dimensions, right? We have the vertical, we have the horizontal, and we have the sagittal, right? So we're going to go light and we're going to strong. And even there, you saw that I did it quick which means I'm already complying, I'm already into states. Because you can't do one by itself. So you can do strong, slow, or you can do it quick, or you can do it kind of with flow, which is kind of just like, either flow is either free or, um, free flow or bound flow. Okay. Light, strong, quick, indirect, sustained, quick. And let's do the left side. Okay, so we're gonna go light, we're gonna go strong. And that was kind of more bound flow. We're gonna go direct. And we're gonna go indirect. And we're gonna go sustained. Quick. Okay? So that's the basics of all effort qualities when you see anything happening. But then what happens, to Abe's point, if I actually go into this diagonal, so this becomes the cube, right? So the cube is kind of, my pelvis is facing forward, but I'm kind of like spinning off into equal expressions of all the dimensions, right? So it's both high, and it's also forward, and it's also to the right. It's also horizontal. So to give you an example, if I go into that space, I'm gonna go light because it's up, I'm gonna go sustained because it's forward, and I'm also going to go indirect because it's wide, it's, it's, it's open. So that becomes something like this, like that, <laughs> okay? So it has to be light and I have to kind of slow down at the end and I have to kind of take in all the space up there. So that they call the float, so I'm kind of floating. So you want to guys to try float? And then the opposite of that, because you're on the diagonal, so it's going to be, it's the exact opposite of that, and that's what Abe just said. So I'm up here, and I'm going to go way back here. So I'm going down, so I'm going to be strong. I'm going across my body, so I'm going to be direct, and I'm going back, so I'm going to be quick. So that's a punch. So you're basically floating to a punching, right? So float, and then punch. And if you had a lot of space, the idea would be to get, get as low as you can. So I'm gonna show you the other, the other section real quick and you guys can kind of do it with me, right? So we do float, punch, and then we go here. What's the difference when I go here but when I go here? What's the different dimension? Exactly. So if this is a float, what would that feel like then over there? You're on the spot now, no, you're not. <laughs> so if this is a float because it's light, sustained and indirect, this just has directness on the site, so um, so it's really, they call it a glide. So I'm still going to slow down, and I'm still going to be light, but I'm, um, I know where I'm going, and I'm going to go to that one thing. So it's a glide. Float, punch, glide, and then this is going to be indirect now, so it's going to be a slash. So it's kind of like you're just like taking out a lot of things. So you're not just punching one thing, you're taking out the whole room. Right? Do you guys want to try that? Try float, punch. <laughs> And then try glide, slash. And you gotta kinda get things out of your way and just like, cause you're gonna hit something in a slash, cause that's the nature of a slash. You're gonna hit multiple things. Okay, so try that. Here we go. We're gonna go float. And we're gonna go punch, punch. And then we're gonna go glide, 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 slow down, light, light, light. And then you're gonna go slash. 
Okay. You're going to hit people, and it's going to, you know, people are going to have bloody noses. Okay, and then we're going to finish this off with the, with the back. So float, punch, guide, glide, slash. This is like a dab. So it's the same thing as this, but now you're going back. So instead of it being sustained, it's quick, right? So it's the opposite of a glide in terms of its sagittal dimension. So I just did slash, and now I'm going to go dab. So it's light, it's quick, direct. Dab. That's all it is. And then moving forward is the opposite of a punch in a way. I mean, you can, it's opposite of a lot of things, but so I'm going to be moving down, so I'm strong. I'm moving forward, so I'm sustained, and I'm moving across my body, so it's a so it's indirect, so it's a ring. So you're basically taking a towel and you're kind of wringing all the water out. Does that make sense? It's the opposite of a dab, all right? So I'm going to go dab, and then I'm going to go ring. So it's all the space, it's strong, and it's sustained at the end. So you're basically moving all the space into a ring. Yeah? Float, punch, glide, slash, dab, ring, and then this is flick. Quick, light, indirect. It's kind of all that stuff up there. Flick, flick, press. So that's the diagonals. Those are the diagonals. So we'll just kind of play with it, just a couple times. We won't even do the left side. Um, float, punch, glide, slash, dab, ring, and we're going to go flick first. Flick, press. Okay. That's the di so that's the dimensions, those are the diagonals, and then when you really get into crazy scales is when you get into the planes, and that's when you're kind of flying all over the room, and that's when you, you're going through that casahedron, which we won't have to do, and it's, but that's, the, that's, that's actually the fun one. So the idea is when you combine movements to combine, to be aware of these different, and you use only them. So if you go, you don't go quickly forward. No, you can. It's just called a disaffinity. And then you have the choice of basically making something interesting if you're, doing a, if you're a choreographer because disaffinities are interesting. Like you see a lot of times, you see a dance where someone falls to the ground, but they also see if they sustain to the ground and they're moving up as they're moving down in terms of their effort, then it also becomes even more dynamic because it's unexpected and it's not how we normally see things. But psychologically, because we're kind of, but psychologically, because we're kind of putting ourselves out there, you feel the disaffinity. You feel it. And people have different associations with different efforts. Some people like um, direct space that's just uncomfortable for them. So when they're doing this, they're like, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good to be this way. You know, in efforts, if you do an effort right, it's creepy. You have to go, you can't just do, you can't just do it. If you're really gonna be light, you have to really do it, and you really have to do it. And people don't like it. It's 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 emotional to have to do it. So you see, you know, there's people crying and I can't do sustainment or whatever the thing is, you know, because it's, it, it brings up your, you know, the core of what you're able to do, you know. So then when you get into the planes, you basically, this is the last thing I'll say about the planes. So when you're in the acosahedron, the thing that's interesting about the, the, the acosahedron in terms of the plane is that when you're in this space here, which is both vertical and horizontal, you fall out of it into the sagittal. And what, the reason why you do that is because um, Laban, noticed how drunk people kind of walk down the street. So if you are kind of like drunk and you're kind of walking around, you're falling into the missing dimension. So if I'm here in the vertical, I'm going to fall into the sagittal and then I'm going to kind of like stumble over here into the horizontal. Because that's something about how we were put together. We're put together to move through planes and to kind of catch ourselves in the thing that's missing which I think is kind of interesting. So the, so the skill is basically that. You're kind of falling through all the kind of missing dimension, the missing dimensions of the different planes. So it's just interesting. For whatever it's worth, it's interesting stuff. <laughs> so that's it. You can talk to whatever. So let's say this, uh, maybe we can see for a few more yeah. minutes. I guess. <laughs> So uh, let's say if you would, uh, somebody invent some new dancing style. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
I guess you would see some archetypes through these dimensions in it. Would this be the right way of saying it? Well, you would you'd immediately notice kind of the whatever the the stress is in terms of the platonic solid. So obviously a new dance style is probably not going to happen. Well, I shouldn't say that. The, the octahedron is done because there's been so much ballet. And even like when you think about Merce Cunningham's work, it's very kind of balletic and it's kind of spatial archetypes, but then he tilts it into the plane. All it does is gives you the language and the eyes to be able to see what's happening. And you can still enjoy it, obviously, but I think movement is one of those things that is, is badly described. It's hard to see. And it just gives you a framework for being able to observe these things, you know? What about simple dances like disco or something like this? Same oh. thing, same thing. So yeah. To describe sure, sure, but there's mm -hmm. some constraints because of, I don't know, social or... There's no, there's no constraints. There's no constraints. No. It, it, I think that the, a lot of people in dance used it because I think that they wanted to be able to talk to people and talk to uh, dancers and and understand what they were seeing that they liked or understand what they wanted to do. But um, coaches use it. It's, it's, it's not confined to any type of uh, modality that uses the body. It's open. So my, my question is more like a particular dance style would probably would emphasize certain elements more and sure. certain less. So this sure. More yeah. Like well, and obviously, you know, you have things like rhythm and all that kind of stuff, which is, you know, which is both time and effort in terms of what's happening, right? So rhythm is just a combination of kind of the temporal aspect and time. The, so you have a difference between like uh, time in terms of quantitative time, and then you have time in terms of weight, or uh, um, you have time in terms of weight, but also you, or in terms of effort, and then you also have both the idea of kind of quantitative weight and qualitative weight. So all that kind of comes together in terms of rhythmic styles. Yeah, but, but all those like body organization and you know, you've seen people in discos who are either kind of like floppy in terms of how they're using their shape, you know. So the, the, the idea of shaping is how, you, how your body relates to the environment around it. So there's like a kind of um, a passive shape flowness, which is really about kind of your breath and about kind of being open and letting your shape kind of ooze over the, all over the place. And there's people who kind of really kind of constrain, constrain how they shape the space. So those are things that would be immediately recognizable in like social dance forms. Mm -hmm. How you're how you're comfortable in the space around you. As a you know, as just one way of looking at it. Uh, does, does this schemes also work for the limiting case for posture when there is no movement? Um, in this there's there's not the idea of no movement. Like there's the idea that somebody is not moving through space, but there's always kind of fluctuations in terms of um, cellular activity, breathing activity. So somewhere when I was looking up yoga on um, the internet here and someone was teaching yoga from the body-mind centering uh, standpoint, which is an application of this as well. So body-mind centering deals with embodying and being familiar with and sensing the fluid movements of your body, like literally, literally like the different fluids inside your body. So this work would say, that unless you're dead, there's movement happening and you can observe it and be aware of it and use it. So when you think about Alexander technique or anything that's about kind of aligning, subtly aligning energy, it's all still movement on a subtle, subtle level. So that's what they would say. And I, I think I agree with it. <laughs> so, um, would there be any characteristic dances for any of these uh, platonic structures? Uh, so, as you mentioned, ballet is typical for octahedron. Mm -hmm. So, what about other dances? How do they fit? And what about martial arts? I guess they also have a lot of these elements. Of sure. Movement. Yeah. So, I would have to look at the examples because, the, again, you know, somebody could be, how do you say the Brazilian martial art? Capoeira? Capoeira. So, obviously, I would say capoeira as a form is not um, dimensional, it wouldn't be kind of an octahedral form. It feels like to me that it's more, um, it's, a, it's a lot about the kind of like the, the planes in terms of forward and backness and a lot of kind of cycling through the planes as you kind of go in vertical and kind of like put your arm down and your leg goes up. So it's very planar, but also all this stuff is also stylistic. So, you know, if you're a good, if you have a good eye, you can basically train your students to work in the right 
kind of spaces, the right kind of spatial pathways, but stylistically, someone can choose to do it in a different way as well. So as a form, there's probably a right or wrong, but you probably can't just say that it's always octahedral, always you know, dimensional or uh, diagonal, or you know, it's, it's, it's all stylistic too. But again, that's why it becomes a good language, because if you want your dancers, you want your students, you want your athletes to do something in a very particular way, you have the language to say, you're cycling too much in the vertical plane, and that's why you're losing the connection to your hamstring, and that's why you're not going fast enough or whatever the thing is. So. This be used in computer games to encode the movement of the characters. They did, um, so you know, when, you know when you see computer animation and they miss kind of like the breathing aspect or stuff? Like, sh like the idea of shape change is that your body's actually, sh the body, your shape of your body changes, and obviously our body is held together by atmospheric pressure, and so there's these, there's these dynamics of pressure coming into your body and then the cellular breathing and the actual respiration that changes your shape. So that's why games in the past have looked so not real, but they're starting to understand how to kind of like code that into, because they, that's what the sensor has done. So they don't know that they've done that because there is one person that, that was one of my teachers that is working with animation, but um, because they're putting all the sensors over the body, they're able to track those movements even though they didn't have a language for it. And they're, so they're able to, lap, to, to add in those things like shape change. But when you do a model of something, you don't know that, if we just sat here, you wouldn't think that the actual shape of a body changes because that's not how we're, we normally think about stuff. So you need that extra data from sensors to know that there's actually shape changes that are happening. You know? So, does that, does that? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was, from the beginning, I was thinking like if, if it would be possible to encode Prince of Persia movement, for example. The, yeah. This, the stuff. Sure, and they must use that because when you think about the their modeling um, environment, they have to know that it's moving in three dimensional space. So they have a cube around the person, even if it's not a kinosphere where it's close. It's a cube where the, where basically the points are plotted, and they know how to move that that animation through space. So they're, they're already using modeling of three-dimensional space. They're just, uh, it's just not, um, they probably haven't got it down to the, to the, to the level of, of kinospheric movements. So just, just to like wrap it up, what's interesting to me, I think, for, for this for you, is that when you guys work with, with how you work and there's lots of data, the, you guys create visualization ways to, to look at it. You create um, containers in terms of being able to, to observe it. And this is kind of like a pre-technology a pre way that, that this guy did it. Um, and I think those constructs that you use in terms of um, um, plotting data uh, is very similar to this in a lot of ways, in terms of uh, plotting stuff in three dimensions. This was how he did it in terms of observation. Um, and the data points are only like, you know, not a lot. There's not a lot of data points, obviously. Like, um, if you put the octahedron with the cube with the icosahedron, that's the main spatial points that he, that he uses. Um, but um, I think that there might be other ways to kind of think about visualization besides, um, you know, the things that are available to us now. I don't know what they are in the future, but I think that they're, you know, well, what's interesting, I guess, for us is first uh, this notation for the movement at all. I mean, uh, uh, well, at least for me, this was new, although it's old. Uh, and uh, also, I mean, the concepts which you were talking about, we just use maybe different words. Yes. Yeah. Uh, eigenvectors. I mean, to, to remember. Right? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> but um, yeah, the concepts are the same, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Maybe this dimension. Basic dimensionality is a little bit lower than we operate mm -hmm. uh, in, but uh, not necessarily. I mean, there, there are systems which have this, yeah, I don't know, this couple of degrees of freedom or major yeah. degrees of freedom would be like this, and then there. Uh, yeah. Uh, so in that sense, it's uh, it's very similar. I mm -hmm. guess in a similar way. I mean, if you would extend the idea, I guess philosophers might uh, see the world through this eyes, also society in the same way probably can, uh, can be also uh, understood, modeled and mm -hmm. so on, uh, although we, 
not that I'm aware that we would have a notation on how to describe, uh, I don't know, Slovenian versus German versus yeah. uh, Brazilian society or culture, if yeah. you want. Which, again, I'm sure that there are some regularities which uh, yeah. uh, are dimensions along which you somehow position one or the other. So. Yeah, and part of the program that I went through is literally... Um, the goal of it is training observation, so that you actually can um, start seeing stuff that you that you may not have ever realized. And, and once you create a language about it, you can remember what you've you've seen. So this ties into my work at Four Thirty Two C because you know you're doing focus groups, you're observing people. They might say they get something, but you know they don't get something based on their behavior. So all that kind of those observational skills become a user experience tool to, to make better user experiences based on observation. Like it all comes down to people are using your devices, they're using your products, you need to be sensitive to their, to their behavior and whatever tools you have to help you with that become um, beneficial to your product creation.